chapter 16. Luke 24. Luke 24. Luke 24. Okay. Must be hard to get to. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, and behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Go ahead and be seated. As we start studying our Bibles, and typically start with the book of Genesis, you know, and we see where Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We don't know whether it looked like an apple or not. It was just what God told them not to do. And after that, we see the result we see the formula over and over. He's lived so many years, 940 years, 970 years, and he died, and he died, and he died over and over again. And as we go down through history, we read about important people, and the biography always ends with something like, on a certain date, and he died. We have people that we consider important religious teachers. A guy by the name of Gautama Siddhartha, which you probably know as the Buddha, taught. He taught some, actually, some pretty good things about living, how to live your life. But he died and all of his followers died. The Buddha said, I am not important. What I do is of no uh, consequence at all. What I say, my teachings, those are the important things. Hang on to those. We have numerous religious leaders that are of the same genre. Pay attention to what I say. My particular person is not important to the, it's not germane to the topic at all. And they died. Jesus comes along, and there are many people who revere Jesus' teachings. But if we really study Jesus' teachings, his uh, uh, his moral code, so to speak, we see that he's really not coming up with anything of his own. Uh, Jesus is reiterating what the prophets had already said. If you look at Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, etc., you'll see that they taught pretty much the same thing. And most of the teaching of Jesus is reminding the Jews uh, to the, the extent to which they had failed to keep God's law. The prophets taught what they taught and they died. That's the formula that goes throughout all of humanity. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 
He says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. We call that the substitutionary atonement. In terms of the Mosaic law, he became a sin offering on our behalf. And not just a uh, lamb or goat that uh, it was the uh, sacrifice had to be offered over and over again. The pure, unblemished Son of God was sacrificed for our sins for a permanent substitutionary atonement. And Paul says that he was buried. And if it ended there, all we would have would be his great moral teaching. And that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He raised from the dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah is right. Hallelujah. He didn't he died, but he didn't stay dead. Thank you, God. This is a new formula that is going to apply to all of us. We could put that on our gravestones. You know, we're we're all uh, approaching uh, an end at some point. You know, when you're twenty you don't believe it, right? You think this is this is going to go on forever, but it's not. But we have a new formula. He died, but he didn't stay dead. And we can put that on our tombstones. Uh, he died, but he's not going to stay dead. But it says that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, and then to the twelve. He uh, appeared to those... <coughs> that knew him. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now. Paul is essentially saying here, you know, there's, there's evidence, there is eyewitness testimony. You can go talk to some of the people that were there, that saw him. 500 at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Good, strong, eyewitness testimony by numerous witnesses. It says then he appeared to James, his brother, the one that didn't believe in him. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also on the road to Emmaus, or on the road to uh, uh, up north. Damascus. Damascus, there we go. On the road. On the road. <laughs> on his horse that we don't know about. After this, John tells us, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. We might... Uh, read that and not grasp the significance of it. We might think, well, his life is finished. But that's not what he said. Uh, the Greek word there is tetelestai, is in the perfect tense, as in it's all done. There's nothing left to do. Uh, the word can mean something is totally accomplished. Everything I set out to do, I've done. It's also used in accounting, a banking term, meaning when a loan is paid, they stamp tetelestai on the document. It's paid in full. The debt is paid. As uh, I think it was Don Francisco who wrote the song, He's Alive and I'm Forgiven, Heaven's Gates Are Open Wide. Hallelujah. 
Paul in Colossians says, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. His death on the cross provided our substitutionary atonement, which forgives us all of our transgressions. And if you think you don't have any transgressions, read Exodus and Leviticus sometime. Uh, we have a lot. Uh, and the law says, uh, you shall not commit adultery. And everybody's lying. I'm okay there. I haven't done that. Uh, maybe. And Jesus says, well, you, if you even look at a woman with lust, you have committed adultery. You have failed to keep the law. That's what I meant when I said Jesus was, and most of his teaching was explaining to his Jewish audience how badly they had gone astray, even though they thought they were doing good. Paul goes on and says, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. The Mosaic Law, the certificate of debt, which is hostile to us. See, if we weren't sinners, there'd be no need for the law. There'd be no need to remind us of how badly uh, we have failed to be what God created us to be. And who is the number one proponent of the Mosaic Law? Satan. Satan. Joanne got it. Very good. Satan is the number one proponent of the law. It tells us in the scripture that he stands before God day and night accusing the brethren, right? He is the accuser. Paul tells us that he had disarmed the rulers and authorities. He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Rulers and authorities. Who are the rulers and authorities? Well, Paul explains in Ephesians 6, 12, that is not on, there, on the screen. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. There are spiritual forces allied with Satan, Satan's angels, that are involved in the process, the endeavor of destroying as many human beings as possible. Jesus said in John 12, 31, now judgment is upon the world, and now the ruler of this world will be cast out. The cross was not only a propitiation for our sins, but it is the defeat of the devil and his plans. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. Paul was not there to explain to them the moral code. Uh, he was not there to propound the law. He said, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He goes on, he says, yet we do, do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. Who are the rulers of this age? Satan and his angels. Okay. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. Wisdom in a mystery. Hidden wisdom. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. None of Satan, Satan and his angels did not get it. They didn't understand. 
They thought that when Jesus died, he was dead. Their adversary had been defeated. If they had understood, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, we have this big question, who's responsible for crucifying Jesus? It tells us right here, Satan and his minions are responsible for crucifying Jesus. Everyone, including his disciples, thought that he had failed. His mission was over. And the powers and principalities of the world thought they had won. They thought they had done away with this troublemaker. In Hebrews it says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. The devil had the power of death. You know, from the Garden of Eden on forward, that same formula, and he died, and he died, and he died, was under the control of Satan. That was the world that Satan wanted. God never intended that, and every one of us knows it. Everyone who has suffered the loss of a loved one experiences that understanding that this is not right. There's something wrong here. There's something broken. And he might free those who, through fear of death, were subject to slavery all their lives. Scripture goes to quite an extent to tell us over and over again, all four Gospels tell us that Jesus was actually dead and that he was buried. In John, it says that after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission, so he came and took his body away. Now, if you go to the place in Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified, and of course it's kind of hard to uh, get a good picture because uh, there is a very large, gaudy uh, Catholic church built over the top of it. And we have this vision of uh, the three crosses on the hill. Uh, but that's not how it is. It's a relatively flat spot, uh, and there's a big rock there, a uh, rock probably as big as this alcove. It's hard to tell because it's all covered over in cement, and there's, but there's a little window where it's glassed in where you can look through the glass and you can see the rock. And that is assumed to be the rock that resembles a skull. Once again, we can't really tell because it's all covered over. Uh, that is the place of the crucifixion, or right close by. And about 100 feet away is the tomb. And you can actually go, uh, you have to go through a, a cellar door, so to speak, <coughs> down under the floor of this big uh, church that uh, conceals what it might have looked like in Jesus' day. But it says that Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bowed it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. As I say, it's maybe 100 feet away. And therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The implication was they didn't finish with the burial uh, process. But it was important to the powers and principalities 
as well as to the members of the Sanhedrin who had wanted him crucified because he was a meddler in their affairs, I suppose. It was important to everyone concerned that he stay buried, that he stay dead. Now on the next day, the day after the preparation, this is Matthew 27, 62, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate. And he said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days I am to rise again. Now, you probably, if you read between, between the lines, you'll probably kind of notice that Pilate is making some money here. I mean, Roman procurators did not do favors without bribes. That's just how it operated. That's just how it worked. So Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea go to Pilate. They want the body of Jesus. Uh, and they're both rich. And so the implication is they paid him off. And then members of the Sanhedrin come once again to Pilate. And they say, we want a guard. Uh, it says, remember when he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I am to rise again. They were paying better attention than the disciples were. <laughs> it says, therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. So Pilate's, you know, taking his bribe, likely. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, you know, you have soldiers that I have put under your uh, command to, you know, for security reasons, use them, post them at the, the, uh, at the tomb, uh, and he says, make it as secure as you know how, as secure as possible. And they went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. So we have uh, the governor's permission to use Roman soldiers for a guard. Uh, and I'm sure he authorized the seal. So this is the seal of Rome uh, on the stone. Cannot be broken under pain of death. But it says in Luke 24, 1, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And this is the fact that nobody from antiquity disagrees with. We have uh, letters written by Roman officials speaking of the fact that the body of Jesus was missing. Uh, the Jews wrote it into their Talmud that the body of Jesus was missing. Their explanation is that uh, the guards were asleep, and while the guards were sleeping, of course, that's a, a, that's a capital offense, sleeping on guard duty, uh, the disciples came and stole his body. And, and they said, uh, these, uh, the guys in charge of uh, temple security, said, we'll fix it up with the governor. We will take care of him. So Pilate is going to make another bit of money here, uh, another bribe, to let these guys off. It would be better if this deception, uh, rather than the other deception, uh, became the uh, official uh, narrative. <coughs> We have all kinds of official narratives today, right? We know about official narratives. There's the truth, there's the lie, and then there's the official narrative. <laughs> While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said, men said to them, why do you seek the living one among the dead? The living one. He is the living one, the one who lives in and of himself. 
he has life independent of everything else. He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Of course, we come to our modern times and we want to put this story right, you know, along with uh, uh, stories of other uh, uh, other people, uh, other great figures of history uh, who have died. And possibly, uh, you know, there are legends uh, that King Arthur never died and he'll, you know, return someday. And like C.S. Lewis said, the, uh, the sooner the better. Uh, but we have no, we have no real information. Uh, with the Gospels, we have uh, direct eyewitness testimony that was written down soon after the fact. Now, interestingly, the eyewitnesses differ a little bit. Not much, a little bit. Uh, but they do, there are little bit differences between what Paul says and what Matthew says and what John says. Slight differences. Uh, by the rules of evidence that are even in use today, if you have a story told by four or five witnesses and it does not differ in any aspect, then all but one is the true story, and maybe that's not true. It's they, the story was rehearsed. So when you have small differences, it actually enhances the evidentiary value of the witness. <coughs> this is a historical fact. By, by the rules of historical investigation, the resurrection of Christ is a fact. And it proves that Jesus Christ has atoned for human sin, as he claimed, and that he is the Son of God, and he is the Jewish Messiah. It's proof of all these things. And it's proof that we have free forgiveness of our sins. Uh, and we have the, the free gift of entrance into God's heavenly kingdom by personal faith in his work. And his resurrection proves it all and it proves that he is the victor over death. There have been a number of people who have approached the story of the resurrection skeptically, you know, scholars. Uh, C.S. Lewis says that uh, people who are skeptics really need to watch what they read. They really need to be careful because there's pitfalls everywhere. Uh, many of these skeptics, in fact most of them, who have approached the topic of the historical validity of the resurrection have come away with it, uh, you know, trying to disprove it, they have proved it to themselves. Uh, there was a guy, late 1800s, I can't remember his name, but he began investigating the claims of the resurrection. Uh, started out as an unbeliever, became a believer through his study. And he wrote a book presenting all the evidence called Who Moved the Stone? Who Moved That Stone Away? Well, we have the testimony that it was angels that moved the stone away. Now, there's a story out there that, uh, you know, one of these explanations for the resurrection that says that, well, Jesus was not really dead. Uh, he was uh, uh, put in the tomb thinking he was dead, but he revived. Now, you know, he had a spear wound in his side. He had nail holes in his 
hands and feet uh, and uh, had been flogged nearly to death uh, before the crucifixion even started. Uh, and supposedly he came to in the tomb and he pushed the stone away himself and somehow scared away the uh, Roman guard and went away somewhere. H.G. Wells had a really uh, interesting take on it. That was that uh, uh, the same sort of thing, but except that Jesus colluded with the Romans and that uh, ah. they took him off somewhere, never to be heard from again. Uh, but the resurrection of Christ remains one of the great facts of history if we look at it with standard uh, historical scholarship. The failure of every alternate theory strongly suggests that there is no logical substitute for the fact. None of it deals adequately with the historical evidence. evidence. And so far, even in our modern times, or postmodern times, if we want to get uh, technical, no one has ever come up with an adequate explanation of what it, the uh, authorities of the time agreed on. The tomb is empty. He is risen. Amen? Amen. 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 Mike, uh, it's interesting that so Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, and probably Joanna too, they were there, and they look inside, they see an empty tomb, and what do they do? They're perplexed. They didn't figure it out. They had to be told. Yeah. And so he had told them over and over, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be but, handed over. But they still didn't get it. They still didn't they get were it. Told. And that's almost like, and that just means that we don't believe until we're given a new heart to believe that we're, until we're told. That's we're right. Told. We can't figure it out. That's right. That's true. We're given the heart to believe. That's a very good point. Let's pray. Lord, we're truly thankful for the, uh, uh, just for what you've given us. Uh, the, the law is uh, completely contrary to our nature. Uh, all the great teaching of all the uh, great uh, sages of all time that tell us uh, how we should live, uh, even though these things are uh, helpful, beneficial, the fact is that we have a bridge to cross, uh, and the only bridge is you. And we're just thankful, Lord, that uh, you rose from the dead in order to show us that uh, we also will rise from the dead and live with you. We're just thankful for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.